Hey, welcome to our live stream. Deploy Kubernetes in the kitchen sink. And we're going to be deploying an Nginx ingress controller with Pulumi. We're super excited. My name is Stu Shader. I'm your host for today. I'm part of the Nginx business unit in N5 as a business development manager, and I'm super excited for today's session. It's the second part of our live cast series. Um, if you just caught us now, you want to go back and listen to the other one, you can. You can also rewind this one. We're, we're in a DVR mode. But today we'll be presenting to you how you can deploy your cloud infrastructure and your Kubernetes infrastructure all with Pulumi. And we're so excited, so happy to have the two experts here we had last time. Um, if you didn't catch our last one, this is Lee Briggs. Lee is a developer advocate at Pulumi with about 10 years of experience designing, building, and maintaining distributed and complex systems. He wears the scars of many deployment tools. And when he's not trying to fit monolithic applications into containers, he plays and watches soccer and takes lots of walks with his family and dog, Cindy. Um, Elijah Zupanik, I, I'd like to introduce you to him. He's a solution ar architect for Nginx with experience as a software engineer, an architect, and a technical manager. Elijah has been leading software teams in architectural design, product development, and holistic improvement for about 10 years and also loves to geek out on infrastructure, architecture, application composition, service design, and the psychology of making real world applications work. I'm gonna turn it over to him and he's gonna take it from here. Elijah. Hi folks. I'll be introducing what my team at Nginx has uh, been working at for, gosh, it's been maybe the better part of uh, six to seven months now. Basically, we've put together a reference architecture using Kubernetes that illustrates how to assemble a production ready application. Um, right now, it's mainly aspirational, um, but we're really doing our best to not make this a toy uh, example. And rather, we're trying to bring as many principles to bear that you would in a real production app, um, because the existing examples out there have leave way too much as an exercise to the reader. Um, that said, I want to um, emphasize that everything we'll be showing you today is open source and available on GitHub. And you'll probably get the most value in diving into the source code and looking at the examples for yourself. So um, take a look at the reference architecture on GitHub here. We should get my, there we go. Uh, so all of this is open source. Uh, go check it out for yourself and don't take my word for it. Um, okay, so at a high level, uh, what are we doing? So everything we're doing in this architecture is in service of the deployment of a single application. So what we've done is we've created a fake or um, banking application that is based on the project uh, out of Google called Bank of Anthos. So we took the Bank of Anthos example app and we forked it and we've called it the Bank of Sirius. We did this in order to um, better illustrate some of the practices we're trying to illustrate. Uh, or Yeah, and so this is our goal. This at a high quality of service, scalability, um, performance, security, maintainability, upgradability, deployability, all the abilities. Uh, so let's take a look at what is actually running behind the scenes to deliver this app. Okay, so first what we have is we have Pulumi standing up cloud art infrastructure on AWS. So when you look at the you look at the top items in this kind of little cascade that comes down, uh, you'll see there's VPC, EKS, and ECR. Um, and Pulumi deploys those pieces uh, first, and then we move on to uh, working on the components of a Kubernetes cluster. So what's really key here is the very first thing we need to do is get a working Kubernetes cluster up and running, and then we go and deploy Kubernetes components to that cluster using Pulumi as well. 
So uh, everything after ECR there is all native Kubernetes deployments uh, done in Pulumi. Um, and I think this is actually pretty cool because all the steps after creating the cluster and the registries are relatively portable across uh, Kubernetes clusters. Um, so uh, what another interesting thing to note here is each one of these colored items is a separate uh, Pulumi project and uh, they all link together and we'll go into the details about that a bit later. Um, so let's go talk about what is being done with Kubernetes, inside of Kubernetes. Um, that's a little bit maybe unique um, in this reference architecture. So uh, in order to deploy Kubernetes ingress controller, uh, the Nginx ingress controller, I should add, um, we had to add uh, a little bit of extra logic um, to our Pulumi deployments in order to make it um, repeatable and, and configurable. And we did this with a Helm first model in mind. So uh, we deploy ingress controller to the uh, cluster using Helm. But in order to do that, uh, we, need a, we need to build a image of the ingress controller itself, or we need to pull it from an existing public or private repository. And what we've done in the uh, reference architecture is we've completely scripted uh, that out. And so if you want, just to kind of like set the base of what I'm talking about, um, this is the ingress controller I'm speaking of. This is the Nginx Kubernetes ingress controller. And so it is a component that load balances um, all the in incoming traffic to your Kubernetes cluster to your backend application services. Um, and so in that previous slide, we saw all of the things that had that kick hyphen were in reference to that. So kick K Kubernetes ingress controller. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, everything on this slide and, and what we did. So what we did is we used a what's called a dynamic provider in Pulumi to do a Docker build process that was being managed by a make file. I didn't create any of this. An engineering team created this for building images, but we were able to do it in a, um, a model that actually matched uh, Pulumi's life cycle. Um, maybe I want to kind of turn to Lee. Do, could you better define what a uh, dynamic provider is in Pulumi? I would love to. So um, within Pulumi, you have this concept of a resource, which is something that Pulumi manages. And most resources that you are dealing with come from um, resource providers. So for example, the AWS provider or the Kubernetes provider and the, the create, replace, update and delete lifecycle is defined by that provider. However, in, in some situations, there are certain APIs that you want to call that are not kind of managed by a, an existing provider. So uh, our friends, uh, some of our friends uh, in, in other organizations haven't quite got around to creating providers that actually talk to their API. A dynamic provider allows you to write code in Pulumi any code in the, you know, in any, co any code in the languages that are supported, so Python and TypeScript. And it will allow you to actually call those APIs as part of the Pulumi lifecycle and do operations when you do a create. Um, and so in your example, uh, you want to call a make file. Um, and so when you run, let's say, make build, that would be a create operation in Pulumi's lifecycle. And then when you do make clean, that would be a delete operation. Dynamic providers are super useful in Pulumi because it allows you to basically do whatever you need to do. Um, we have some great examples, um, which I will uh, fish out in just a moment and um, kind of put in the, in the uh, we'll have a, a, sc a scroll in a few seconds. But we have some great examples of things that you might want to do, for example, adding slash 
Slack web hook, hooks is a great example of things that you might do with a dynamic provider. Um, a, a, a community user did a really great dynamic provider, which is called throw files in S3, which will crawl a directory and upload a bunch of files to an S3 bucket. Um, so there's some really, really great examples out there. And what you're talking about, I think, is a, is a classic use case for a dynamic provider within Pulumi. It allows you to kind of hook into any object that you want. Uh, the final thing I'll also talk about is if you're from an, an, another infrastructure as code background and you're used to doing things like a remote exec, so like let's say you provision an EC2 instance in AWS and you want to kind of do something on the actual file system, so log into the box and actually do something, um, you can use dynamic providers for that as well. So they're super, super powerful mechanisms. I use them all the time for kind of smaller little operations as part of the resource lifecycle. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, so we'll we'll go into the code a little bit later on this, um, but this is basically the core logic behind the things uh, in the in the diagram that cascade we saw. So if we go to the next slide, here we go. So that that piece here in blue that says kick image build, uh, this is executed as a dynamic provider, and based on the configuration you give to it. It can build a um, Nginx ingress controller from scratch, from code, and create the Docker image um, and add in any number of customizations. Alternatively, you can give it a public repository path, and it'll just pick up those configuration bits and instead of building, just move on to the next stage of execution, which is image push. And image push is, uh, the operation that takes either that existing um, image we just built or or the image we pulled from an external repository and pushes it to ECR, uh, AWS's Elastic Container Registry. Um, and then the next item in that chain, Kick Helm Chart, is taking that reference to the path of the uh, created or pushed or created and then pushed um, uh, ingress controller container image and actually deploying it to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that's kind of like some, probably the, the most complex thing in the reference architecture in terms of the composition of uh, applications and the infrastructure. Um, and I think there's a lot of really kind of cool learnings there um, that we can go through when we look at how we did that in Pulumi. Um, moving down the cascade, um, there's uh, we have Elasticsearch, we have FileBeat, and we have Cert Manager. Um, all three of those are uh, examples of deploying components to Kubernetes via Helm. Um, and I think there's also a fair bit to just learn from the examples in those, although we won't go into that much depth. Um, and then the very last component is maybe the star of the show. It's the actual application you're deploying. Um, and you look at all these other components are all in service of that application. Um, and that's serious. Uh, so if we move on, uh, this is kind of a rough view of what it looks like when you run it. Um, you if you've used Pulumi before, this is a view you're familiar with. Um, I just like to show show this because uh, I can show off the the, the little uh, visual candy of the ASCII art of each component de deploying. So okay, next moving on. Now now we're into some of the interesting bits. So I'd like to um, kind of talk through some of the decisions we did in this project. Um, first up is we decided to use uh, Python as a language for Pulumi. Um, you know, this, it was a really hard decision because there's many languages that Pulumi supports right now. Um, Lee, what are all the languages that are supported? Uh, we, as you mentioned, we, we support the Python eco ecosystem. Uh, we also support the .NET e ecosystem. So C Sharp, F Sharp, and even VB.NET, my personal favorite. And uh, we support the Node.js ecosystem. So JavaScript and TypeScript. And then finally, we also support the Go ecosystem. Um, 
uh, Python is a really great language for for infrastructure as code. I think, especially if you're coming from a background in which you uh, using other configuration management tools like Ansible or something along those lines, um, the switch to to um, Pulumi with Python can be feel really familiar with you. And we have lots and lots of users who are really really comfortable kind of writing their infrastructure in Python. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was for us, it was like, are we going to use Python or Node or TypeScript, right? And it was a it was a hard decision to make. Um, you know, I think what drove our decision was like, okay, both are flexible, both have good support on Pulumi, um, both have lots of open source libraries. Um, probably the inflection for us was in part the um, the availability of what's called a virtual environment mm -hmm. or VM in Python which allowed us to easily com compartmentalize all the binaries uh, as well as uh, even the Python distribution through uh, things like PyEnv and so on. Um, it's not saying that you can't do this with NodeEnv and other tools in, in Node, but there's just so much there for you in the Python ecosystem that allows you to get kind of a repeatable, installable um, platform. Um, and I'll, and I'll show you how we set that up. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of, I think something that's, that's, uh, recently been announced, I think way before you started, uh, you, you started kind of on this, on this path way before this feature was available. But, um, one of the newer features of Pulumi is that you can now write, um, components, which are Pulumi's mechanism for kind of resharing and reusability. You can write them in a single language, uh, such as Python, and then, uh, you can consume them in all of Pulumi supported languages, um, which is um, kind of a new thing. And, uh, you know, my um, my intent is to kind of uh, hopefully get an opportunity at some point in the future to kind of show what that would look like in terms of Nginx. But uh, you can create reusable libraries, write them in Python once, and then distribute them to anybody who's using Pulumi's .NET ecosystem or Go ecosystem on Node.js. So that reusability is, is kind of a new feature. Um, and you can take the all the things that we're about to see, the 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 mechanism to kind of make them reusable in all the other languages is is really not a heavy lift at all. So something to kind of uh, you know if you if you're watching along and you kind of thinking, well, I'd really like to use Python and TypeScript. Well, you can now do that. It's now now an option. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to throw up my uh, environment, my development environment now, and uh, let's take a look at some of these. Um, question for you on that, Lee, is um, is uh, do you have to install the runtime for that environment when you're using? For example, I'm running in uh, Node, but I want to use Python Pulumi libraries. Do I need to install Python myself, or does that just like auto that's, install or something? That's exactly right. Yeah. So um, I personally, uh, one of the great things about working at Pulumi is that I get to switch between four different programming languages on a daily basis. Um, one of the reasons that I like to use the Go programming language for this particular use case of kind of writing things in one language and then having them consumed by everything else is because you can build these really easy repeatable binaries that um, don't actually need the runtime. However, in this particular case, you've written this in Python. Um, you are able to, uh, you would need to actually have the Python uh, binary installed. But of course, on most modern operating systems nowadays, including Windows with the, the WSL, Python is already available. So, you know, I think one of the great things about, um, you know, that we talked about when you started down this path is that Python is usually available to everybody, uh, whereas the Node ecosystem might not always be the case uh, on Windows, for example. Um, but you know, it's it's there as 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 kind of a day one uh, Python binary. It might be an old version, but it'll certainly still work. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Um, and well, let's walk through what setup looks like in this in the reference environment uh, reference architecture. So um, in order to get all your Python pieces, libraries, um, as well as just bin binary or other executable dependencies all together, we've created a bash script. Who'd have thunk it? Um, running it looks roughly like this. Um, what it does is it in installs the core uh, Python dependencies 
and um, potentially Python itself, um, as well as installs a local utility module that's shared across Pulumi projects um, into your VM. What it also does, which is, I think, kind of cool, is that um, there is a uh, EKS in Python uh, Pulumi actually uh, depends on Node. And because uh, VM uh, uh, and actually VM uh, will install via pip, I'm kind of like stuttering here. Um, using pip, you can install uh, Node itself entirely within VM. Um, which I think is really cool and uh, convenient. So that brings along uh, your a completely compartmentalized node install within your VM environment. Um, and so we do that, that portion right here in the script. So there's a dependency called nodeenv, and you'll see that here in our requirements.txt file. Um, we go and we install that into the environment, and there we get a working copy of Node if we, ex if we uh, execute the nodeenv uh, um, command to install the appropriate version of Node, and it all works within that virtual environment. And what's kind of cool about this virtual environment is we actually install uh, Pulumi there as well. Um, so everything is compartmentalized. Yeah. Um, and this makes us sharing this reference architecture uh, to many people a lot easier because everything is just within that VM's uh, bin directory. Uh, so even, even kubectl gets installed there. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Pulumi. Um, we also will install AWS's uh, CLI. Uh, that's called out right here in the requirements text, and that gets installed automatically as part of the virtual environment install. Uh, so what it does is it pulls down all the dependencies uh, needed for the project. It's placed in VM plus the binary um, or whatever scripted language standalone ex executables that support our installation, even some silly things like um, fart that displays uh, ASCII art showing what is uh, each item that's executed. So once um, uh, once setup is run, is run uh, we can run start all, and this will show these nice uh, ASCII art uh, elements that delineate the running of each project within that cascade we saw in the slide. Um, and so you can see e EKS stand up, you saw VPC stand up, each one of these will be run independently. Um, so let's, uh, let's switch back to that uh, slide here in a moment. And I kind of want to go down that list of the interesting items. Let's go back to the previous one. Okay. So uh, we talked about how uh, the dependencies and utilities are managed with VMV. Um, I've started to hint at the start up and destroyer scripted, uh, and also how each directory within the root is a separate Pulumi project. Um, you know, working in this model of having multiple Pulumi projects, we needed to make a decision about how we are going to chain these together and execute. Of course, you could go into every directory and run them one at a time. Um, you could hook them into a CI system to do that as well. Um, that's probably a very good choice. Um, it's not quite where we're at yet with the reference architecture um, and proving things out. Um, uh, additionally, instead of a bash script, you could write Python that does this as well or another language if you needed more control over how you're linking these different projects together. 
Yeah, I, I ju I'll just jump in here as well. Like Pulumi has what we call the automation API, um, which allows you to actually kind of define how you want to run this. So lots of different infrastructures, code tools kind of assume that you're going to be operating on the command line and that you're going to kind of run a something up or a something apply or, you know, something like that. Uh, the automation API um, and, and a common use case for a lot of our users is that they will build an automation API um, wrapper that kind of does things and takes care of the ordering for you. Um, and so that's one option as well. So if we jump back to my CLI here, um, roughly, you can kind of see how this, uh, the start script works. Um, we do a bunch of pretty boilerplate, uh, checking to make sure all of the, uh, command line, uh, utilities that you would be expecting to be installed are in fact installed as a sanity check. Um, and then once we're past that, we actually do uh, a little bit of our own configuration management here uh, so that, for example, we can uh, globally define the name of the Palumi stack across multiple different projects, um, our AWS profile name and our region. Um, and, uh, this, this is a bit, you know, it's just one pattern. I wouldn't say it's necessarily right or wrong, but it's a pragmatic decision we made. And as part of that, um, we did make a pragmatic decision for these multiple projects to share, um, a single configuration. Um, I'd love to hear more about what perhaps, uh, uh Lee thinks of that, um, for us, we sacrificed being able to use Pulumi secrets um, by having a single uh, configuration. So we do all of our secrets in Kubernetes uh, secrets management instead of in uh, Pulumi. Yeah, I, um, like a, a global configuration is is a, is a is a common thing. We're actually looking at adding a, rec uh, a feature for this in uh, the Pulumi configuration. Um, you know, the the Pulumi um, the Pulumi Secrets engine, I think, is really unique um, and interesting because uh, compared to other infrastructure as code tools, in in this in the fact that we don't store the actual sensitive values in state in plain text; they are encrypted by a key that you can choose, um, or you know, we obviously provide a key as well well. Um, but global configuration, I think, is something that um, really is important to a lot of, of folks. And we're looking to add uh, support for that pretty soon, uh, is my understanding. So, um, you know, I, I can totally understand why the, the, the decision was made here. It's just to, to reduce the boilerplate, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and already a lot of the wiring for it is in there. Because within this file, in the configuration YAML file, I can namespace my uh, configuration settings. And so I have a very nice organization of like, hey, here are my AWS settings. Here's my VPC settings. These are my EKS settings. These are my kick helm settings. Um, you know, I can define, as we talked about, we had the image build step. Here I can define a, the source of my image is a registry or we're going to be building it from source. Uh, here's the image name. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these can be really nicely organized in one single place that defines how your infrastructure is built out. Um, so moving on, um, once the, that kind of configuration uh, piece is in place, um, our startup uh, process goes and and does some sanity checks, like we go and make sure that our uh, the right configuration settings are set. Uh, if not, we prompt the user for uh, passwords or credentials that are not entered. Um, additionally, uh, going to move past some of these functions here that are executed later. Um, you know, like I said, we we output a header. We will like run VPC. Once it's up and running, and we've determined that it is in fact running properly, we then move to the next. And by determining it's running properly, it didn't exit with a non-zero code. Um, that's the only check we're doing for up until the very last step. Um, 
But then you'll notice once we have uh, Kubernetes installed, we actually have a step that we go and add uh, the kube config to your local configuration so that you can then use kube cuddle uh, to address that newly created EKS instance. And in fact, um, we go and run a kube cuddle command uh, here. We run version and we try to, and we wait until kube cuddle can properly access uh, EKS. Um, in theory, when AWS returns back the status code that it's done, and uh, EKS uh, has you know returned a non-zero uh, value back, it's up and running and operational. That's the theory. Out of um, after running this, gosh, I must re-executed this maybe three hundred times or so now. I found that in a small percentage of cases. Uh, it, it is a not, in fact, operational after AWS tells you it is. And so this is the, like, nitty-gritty of working with infrastructure, right? It's things go wrong in ways that uh, shouldn't, and you end up adding lots of sanity checks. And so these are one of the, this is one of the sanity checks I found was helpful, was just running a kubectl version and then retrying until it works. Um, but so that we know we have a sane environment so we can move to the next steps. Um, next step after that is ECR, setting up ECR. That's pretty simple. I haven't noticed any sort of lag between uh, AWS's reported um, setup and its actual availability, so we don't do a check. Um, then we do the image build that I spoke of previously. We build the Nginx ingress controller. Uh, and then we push the ingress controller uh, out. And what you're seeing here with this is an interesting um, uh, Mac OSism. So in case you're running on the Mac, uh, you need uh, you need to go enter your pseudo uh, security credentials uh, for Docker in order to make this work. So we make sure that that's unlocked before you get to the next step. Um, then moving on, it's pushed out to uh, uh, ECR, and then we go and deploy the Helm chart. And then things are pretty much pretty boilerplate as like I showed in the in the graph or in the slide until until we get to the end uh, where we actually extract out the um, application URL returned by Pulumi of the uh, load balancer. And then we uh, run a Python script that verifies that, in fact, uh, the final um, site, in this case, though, in the the um, uh, the standup I just did, is actually available. So uh, this will take you to uh, a real live bank of serious uh, deployment. And we have a little Python script. Uh, where is it? Verify. Uh, test.py, I believe. And, uh, and this will go and, oh, that's not it. Okay, where was the verify script? Oh, it's in the series directory. I'm looking in the wrong place. Here we go. And it, and it just does a, a test login um, with uh, the hard-coded credentials, because it's an example app, um, and verifies that the application is working. In, a, in, a, in your own application, I can imagine you could do a much more sophisticated operation like use Selenium or uh, something else to verify that the application is, in fact, up and running as you would expect it um, as a final step. Um, OK. Let's, uh, let's go back to that slide and look at some of the next items of interest in the reference architecture. Okay. Well, great. I actually, all I needed was that flash to remind me of the, the next item I wanted to talk about. So uh, we mentioned how these, uh, these different projects actually connect to each other. Um, 
all in tandem. Let's go actually look at what that looks like in code. So uh, for example, VPC, uh, here we've, we have a, uh, a Python script, the Polony script that stands up VPC. It's nothing particularly unique about it. Um, you know, we do some dynamic operations like create a, uh, uh, a subnet per AZ available. Um, but at the end, what we do is we export two uh, values. And, and Lee, jump in and come, uh, correct me if I get some of this vocabulary wrong. But they're exported to a stack, right? Yeah, so a stack is a reusable instance of Pulumi code. And so uh, right now, this is going to provision to a stack. And once you export these values from a stack, you can then reference them using a stack reference. Um, and so you can grab them from other other Pulumi projects uh, from that stack. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the nomenclature is um, spot on so far. OK, and so you probably, when you've run Pulumi, like here we go, here's our VPC execution that we did, you will actually see these outputs from your stack. Um, and here we go, here's the outputs of that VPC I exported. Um, and, oh, here it is down here, outputs, the final outputs. Here's the AZs we've used and here's the VPC. Um, and so Lee mentioned the stack reference, which is great because that's what I'm gonna show you. So. We've exported the details of the VPC we provisioned, but it's like, how do we get that information into our EKS that we're gonna stand up, right? Because we need this data. Um, well, let me show you how we did it. Um, so down here, uh, what we've done is we've created, uh, we've referenced, uh, the let me let me kind of zoom out here a little bit um there's the vpc definition there it is okay vpc project name and uh and then this is gotten from up here here we go so the first thing we do is we get the project name of the other project we want to reference its stack for and since this is all contained in a relative directory tree, it's easy enough for us to just uh, go to the other sibling directory, VPC, and um, read from its Pulumi YAML and get its name. Um, uh, we've, we've created some utility code uh, that does this for, for us and then we reuse it across projects because it's kind of a, um, a boilerplate operation uh, we do often. And we do a little bit of uh, sanity checking in the process of doing it. Um, so once we have that, uh, then we get, uh, let's see, where's the stack reference here? Here it is, okay. Uh, we create a stack reference ID and in order to do that, we need uh, the current executing user, we need the VPC project name, and we need the stack name. So I just showed how we got the VPC project name uh, by parsing the YAML file. The user is an interesting thing. And Lee, jump in and tell me if I'm doing this backwards. Um, but what we did is we just made a utility function that runs the Pulumi who, I, who am I command to return back who's the currently executing user. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, one of the things I think this is showing off is just how much control and flexibility you get from being able to use these kind of general purpose languages. Um, you know, the the application languages, you, you can, you, the, the sky is the limit really with you in terms of how you actually define your infrastructure once you have these kind of languages at your disposal. So, you know, ultimately, if, if, if what you are doing works and it provisions the clusters, which we know it does, because, uh, you know we've we've seen the results um kind of creating these utility functions and all that kind of stuff is is a really really great way of getting um you know getting the full power out of actually provisioning things 
Yeah. And, and, and to Lee's point, um, you know, I didn't know what I was doing yet. I was totally empowered to go solve the problem. Right now it may come along that I read a blog post and it's like, yo dummy, this is a way easier way to do this. Right. And great. But where I am right now and I need to go actually execute this, uh, this is a wonderful approach because I don't have to go bolt on some sort of templating system onto a DSL uh, to go get this information. I can just use Python um, and, and my life is easy. So I, I, yeah, I, I just want to kind of jump in here if, if you wouldn't mind. I think there's two, you know, if you are watching this either live or watching this back and, and you kind of looking at this, like Elijah, I know you spent a long, long time putting this together. It's very well featured and it's 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 at the at the stage now where it's a, you know, a fully featured set of infrastructure that could easily run a production application. Um, and if it looks overwhelming to you, um, that there, there might be two kind of schools of thought you're coming from. One is, I don't know that much Python. And two is is I don't know that much Kubernetes or um, you know or infrastructure. You might be a software developer and you don't really know about a lot about infrastructure, or you might be an infrastructure person you don't really know a lot about application development. I think the the thing that that uh, and, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Elijah. The thing that I have certainly experienced in the eighteen months I've been at Pulumi is that I come from an infrastructure background and I was really nervous about the idea that I, I wasn't a, a, a very strong and capable software developer. Uh, and as you heard me earlier, I now spend my day switching between four different languages on a, on a regular basis. I think one of the things that I'm uh, like really, really uh, pleased to see from my own kind of growth is that because I'm learning programming languages in the context of infrastructure, which is already a thing I do know, I'm getting, I'm becoming a better software engineer. And if you are a software engineer and you don't understand infrastructure, but you are able to kind of write applications and all that kind of stuff, Infrastructure is easier if you don't have to learn a long, complex YAML document or a long, complex DSL. And I'd love to get your kind of thoughts on what your experience was here in, in terms of like defining this. this Because you know how Kick works and you know how Nginx works and you know how all the different components get, get put together. Um, but do you find that you've kind of become a better software engineer in that time as well? Oh, absolutely. And my background probably is a mirror image of yours. Long history in software engineering a fairly long history in, um, you know, architectural design and design level of infrastructure, but not a lot of experience with Kubernetes. And in fact, I've learned a lot of Kubernetes through the lens of Pulumi. And, and in fact, I really, really struggled uh, with the YAML soup, right? And, uh, and kubectl and modifying this and that YAML and then you know, like how in the hell do I templatize this stuff, right? How do I actually work with this dynamically and like, and make it adaptive? Um, and I couldn't think in terms of the abstractions I was used to, but once I was a, given a programming language that, um, and a framework that managed state in a sensible way, right? That I could say uh, deterministically, I need things in this state before we move to the next thing. It was like, boom, now I can bring software thinking to the infrastructure, right? And that level of automation. Yeah, um, and it, I, I think, you know, if you're thinking, if you're watching the, along here and you're like thinking to yourself, I'm really familiar with Nginx and I know how to deploy Nginx and I know how the Kubernetes controllers work. And you're looking at a way of leveling up your kind of career and thinking about how you become a full stack engineer, for example. I think this is a great opportunity to kind of look at it from that that perspective as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I I personally believe that, and I, and I could talk about the philosoph philosophic this philosophically. Uh, I personally believe this is kind of where the industry is going in terms of general purpose languages that are kind of apply to a lot of things. Um, th th this, this reference architecture is a really, really great starting point to be able to a, learn how the infrastructure gets put together, but B, how a well-defined Pulumi uh, project gets, gets defined too. Thanks, Lee. Kind of to drawing a circle back to this, here you go. This is, this is a stack reference here. Um, you can see how we go and uh, get the subnets and the VPC definition uh, right here with this. What, what might be a little tricky for some people 
is this notion of a callback uh, that's used throughout Pulumi. Um, and what we're doing here is uh, there's a asynchronous, and Lee jump in here too with the terminology, but when you're getting these outputs, um, right here in terms of kind of its logical execution, it hasn't been done yet. And so what you're doing is you're chaining in a function uh, here, which is retrieve VPC and subnets that will be run eventually uh, when it all is executed together as one whole. And so you chain these, these components together much like how you would in a functional model. And then you get a, uh, you get this, this closure VPC definition that you can go pass around uh, in your configuration. And um, somehow behind the scenes, Pulumi sorts this all out. Um, but here you get a stack reference to that previous, uh, previously created project. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really good opportunity to talk a little bit about this because, um, and I, uh, there should be a, a, a link coming along the screen any moment now. Um, um, Pulumi works on the idea that it calls APIs and it calls different cloud provider APIs. And then eventually once those resources have provisioned, you get a response from the API, but it takes a little bit of time. If you're familiar with Node, you're probably familiar with promises. If you've used Python pretty heavily, you'll be understanding of coroutines and async IO. Um, Go has channels and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, essentially what that apply is doing is saying, wait until the value of get output VPC has resolved and then do something. And the link across the screen is my explanation of how this works. Um, the reason it's called apply, which I think is an interesting reason is because it's it's a, a apply is a, uh, a term that is available across most programming languages. You might think of the word await, which is a reserved term. Um, so I, I mean, if I was going to rename this myself, I would call it eventually. Um, but because that's that that's kind of way I think about it. Um, but this is a really great, uh, this is a really great model here that you have of like, get the VP definition from another stack and then do something with it. Great. Well, I think we can bookend uh, the stack reference discussion. Let's go back to that slide and of our outline of some of these next the previous one. Okay. Um, we talked about configuration between projects. We talked about no secrets uh, are used in configuration and we're using Kubernetes secrets. Um, Kubernetes manifests are used as is and read by uh, Pulumi. Let's, let's dive in back into the source code and take a look at this. So um, here in our bank of Sirius, our actual application deployment code, um, what we've done is uh, we actually took the developer defined um, manifests for the different services in the bank of Sirius. For example, there's one called balance reader um, as is in YAML. Um, this is actually a Git submodule here uh, to the application project. Um, you know, all debates of about sub modules aside, um, you know, we chose this as a practical trade-off for now. Um, we let people that understand uh, these manifest files define them as is. We didn't try to impose uh, Pulumi on them. And so using Pulumi, uh, we consume the manifest files as is, and we actually will do some level of transformation if I can uh, find where we are with this. Okay, yeah, so we pull out, we have some logic that dynamically figures out the location of where they are, and we will actually go and uh, load all of the respective files. So we go back to where we were. Um, and then in we can define what is called a configuration group here in, uh, I believe this is a Kubernetes construct, and we can point directly to the files. Uh, so that, that wildcard glob of files, and then we can actually apply a transformation across all those files. And in this case, what we're doing is we're adding a namespace um, 
that uh, I believe was a requirement for us using a cert manager. Uh, and cert manager is a component that allows us to bring in uh, HTTPS or TLS uh, certification uh, uh, certificates. Um, I'm going to pause here, and I'm curious if Lee, if you have anything to say about the trade-offs of this approach versus, uh, say, defining all those things in Python and native Pulumi constructs. Uh, I, I think what the, there's there's two kind of schools of thought really. The using the conf config file um, allows you in in a lot of situations to kind of pull directly from a URL. So if somebody else is maintaining a bunch of configuration files in a GitHub repo, you can just pull them directly from there. Um, and you can reuse these as well. Like, so you don't necessarily need to, to use Pulumi. And I think this is a great example of that. Um, defining it natively with Pulumi gets you a bunch of benefits like Pulumi's A-weight, um, like health checking, which will mean that Pulumi will tell you when the Kubernetes deployment is successful and healthy and give you more information, um, which maybe may or may not be what you want. Um, and then finally, the I think the, Transformations are just such a super powerful and useful mechanism uh, of being able to rewrite stuff on the fly. Um, I, I think there's, you know, both are completely valid. We, we add this config file and config group option for, for just the reason that you are kind of looking at right now, which is I can pull these manifests. I can update them in one place. They're still there and they're defined well, um, and I can just apply them um, directly to the Kubernetes cluster. Great. Let's bookend that. I think this is a, a pretty interesting aspect of the reference architecture and its usage of Pulumi uh, to integrate. Um, probably the last thing I wanted to dive into was uh, some of the, the dynamic resource providers that I, I talked about and, and what that looks like. It might look a little scary uh, from the outside, uh, looking at all these uh, files here in this directory. But what that does mean is that we end up with a very, very simple um, main.py file. Uh, so our actual, like what it looks like as a high level abstraction to someone reading the code and trying to understand how the infrastructure is deployed, they're seeing a very simple abstraction, which is something I really love because it's like, oh, okay, here's the arguments I need to build this thing. Um, here's the resource. Uh, okay, done, right? We've just exported it, uh, which means apply it, make it real, and execute it. Um, and you're like, oh, okay, it's just these two things. And oh, if the setting says we're using an image origin that is a source, a source, I mean source code, otherwise we're pulling from a registry. Um, interestingly, uh, you will see that the uh, the underlying uh, dynamic resource provider is the same, yet the um, uh, the argument class passed to it is different, uh, which helps us drive a different set of configuration parameters and actually um, allows us to have two different providers we're using behind the scenes. So let's go take a look at that. So. Um, what we have here, there's a lot of code here and probably more than we could go into uh, today, but we have a class called ingress controller image. Um, and this basically is a def high level definition of uh, the piece that will invoke uh, the provider. Um, and based on what is the uh, argument class that is passed to it. So this, uh, this is the, the, law, the piece that will allow us to switch between the, the bits for a registry-based um, image creation or a um, uh, source-based image creation. So once it's made a determination, let's go take a look at the probably simpler one, which is uh, the registry-based one, where it's just pulling in uh, Docker images. Um, you know, we can use a lot of OOP principles here, um, you know, because we've got a class and it has methods. And then there's these great methods that are part of a dynamic uh, resource provider. And they give us things like create, 
update diff check and uh, these can be optionally not defined and uh, many times the default um, implementation is fine um, but uh, for example in create uh, and update in this case it's the same so we just pull we just execute a pull operation that pull that executes docker and uh, pulls down the latest uh, image. Um, in fact, since uh, both the, the source code builder um, provider and the registry provider um, are sharing a lot of the same code, we actually can use real OOP here, and we actually have a base provider that provides operations across uh, both providers. So there's common things like, hey, we want to delete a Docker image. Uh, we want to run a Docker image. We want to pull a Docker image. We want to tag a Docker image. Um, uh, we want to get the image ID, or excuse me, we want to get the image ID for an image based on its name, or we want to delete uh, by image, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these functionalities can be defined in a com in a centralized place, and then we have code readers. So there's a lot to go in here. Um, if you're interested in it, I'd love you know people to reach out and uh, over Twitter or GitHub, and we can chat about it. Um, anything you want to talk about here, Lee? No, I don't think so. I like. I just want to reiterate what I said earlier. Like, I think this is such a, a fantastic resource for anybody who is really trying to understand how Nginx and and the Nginx Ingress controller is deployed. If you're a software engineer, and then if you are an infrastructure engineer who already kind of understands how you would do this, and are interested in understanding a different infrastructure's code mechanism, this is such a great resource to be able to kind of run through and understand and and learn from. Um, you know, and and you know, I'll call back to what we talked about earlier with, um, you know, multi-language components. Uh, you know, I envisage a world in which will this become a reusable, uh, a reusable kind of infrastructure component that people can just use off the shelf. It, I think is really exciting. Thanks, Lee. Well, on that note, um, circling back about learning more and uh, growing as a developer or infrastructure person or whatever your role may be that uh, throws you into this whole mess. Um, uh, let's take a look at that deck again, and I'd like to show uh, what is an upcoming opportunity to learn more. So maybe, Lee, you can tell us a little bit about uh, the Cloud Engineering Summit. Yeah, we have an event that's coming up. Uh, I think it's 11 or 12 days away. I'm not exactly sure of the exact timing, um, but we have a, a list of industry kind of experts that I just think is incredible. Um, and we are going to be talking a lot about the different mechanisms that you can use when you're deploying things to different cloud providers. It's not going to be just Pulumi uh, content where we're kind of reaching out to a bunch of industry experts that are going to talk, you know, from Kelsey Hightower to, you know, um, Emily Freeman, who you may be aware of, who's uh, kind of a, uh, an amazing, uh, both amazing people in, in the industry. Um, so you should learn a lot. Uh, and I, I might also understand, Elijah, that there'll be a workshop, a kind of instructor-led workshop um, that will allow you to kind of get hands-on with the stuff that we talked about today. I'm personally the kind of person who learns by doing. And so if you've found something that's interesting here, um, and that you would like to kind of understand um, in, in a more in-depth uh, mechanism, like uh, take a look at the Cloud Engineering Summit page and there's an Nginx workshop and we're super excited about it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to working with people uh, standing this up. Um, ideally, this can be a good template for you to launch a new uh, Kubernetes project with. You just go fork the repo, rip out the example app, have a lot of ready to go um, examples of how you would set up a VPC, EKS, ECR, plus you know, log management, certificate management, uh, and soon to becoming uh, tracing. We're working on getting open telemetry integrated with uh, all of the components in that uh, Bank of Sirius app. 
uh, Java and Python, as well as the open telemetry, I think they're called relay servers, as well as Grafana um, and, uh, you know, long-term storage for that data. Um, so we're hard at work at this. Um, just kind of ending, I'd like to end on the note that uh, we are available and we'd love to talk to you. So um, thank you all for your time and attention. Yeah, did you guys want to take a look at the comments and see yeah. a couple of questions in there? Um, um, flip over to comments. See. Somebody asked about linking IPTV or streaming. I don't know if that's relevant to today's conversation. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure what that, that think, question is. Yeah. I don't think that's. Yeah, that's not exactly relevant. But we do have. Uh, there's documentation out there. Hit us up on. Hit Nginx up on Twitter and and uh, ask the, ask your question there. Um, we can connect you, uh, yeah. to people that would be able to help. Yeah. Um, I see Ryan has made a comment that uh, program that consumes libraries sounds dangerous. Um, I. Don't think this is a consuming libraries that might have been a slip of my tongue. We, we use libraries and dependencies um, like any other software would. Lee, are you going to say something? No, I uh, oh. was was gonna I was gonna say exactly what Elijah said. So uh, yeah, I, I mean I, I think there's the, there's a common um, there's a common kind of thought process around. Uh, infrastructure as code and, you know, yeah. like configuration languages and configuration formats are relatively safe because, you know, you aren't able to do any execution within them. Um, Pulumi has a lot of mechanisms in there that will not allow you to do unsafe things on your machine. So, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, that we have a, we have a bunch of content on our blog that talks about, you know, how it's been designed in order to ensure that, you know, people can't randomly run, uh, you know, code there. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's an understandable thing to kind of th think about. Um, but yeah, uh, and we just had a content, uh, a question from Jay. Um, the example is available on GitHub. Elijah, do you want to, um, yeah, um, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll share my screen to show it off. Um, this would be the first link we we shared on the marquee at the bottom. Um, let's, uh, yeah, there it is. And so let's get it here. And so, yes, it is 100% open source, and it's all available on GitHub. Um, nice. Just so you note, it is in a subdirectory. So you can see that we've somewhat ambitiously planned that there may be examples more than AWS in the future. Um, uh, there's a uh, actually a getting started guide uh, that will help you get up and running. Um, additionally, I didn't mention this uh, earlier, but there are also Docker files that have um, that you can build and run that will uh, provide Pulumi and Python and all the setup uh, scripts all in a single executable place. So you, if you're on say Windows, that might be the easier way to go. I, 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 we, we, the, the, kind of, the kind of question there with the, um, you know, uh, looking at these examples, we do have hundreds of examples on GitHub as well of, of other, um, you know, Kubernetes based things. Uh, I think this is a really great reference. If you do need any help with kind of running this before the workshop, both are Elijah, both Elijah and I hang out in the uh, Pulumi community Slack. Um, and if you want to take this for a ride and you want to learn more about it, both both he and I are in there and, and quite happy to help if you just kind of sign up and join us and we can kind of talk you through it quite happily. Awesome. Well, great. I don't see any more. Oh, there he, uh, Jay thanked us for that. That's awesome. Thanks, Jay. Um, I think I'll just sum everything up. What I learned listening to you both, um, you know, that, that phrase infrastructure as software or, or <clears throat> the flexibility of, of all the different, um, options of languages, I think was, was really key. You know, it was uh, subtle, but, um, that leads us to less sprawl, I think too, right? Um, not too much configuration, but, you know, the users are provided a language they understand. And I think that was really, really important. And that's going to lead me to probably less mistakes, maybe, and maybe a little bit faster in producing and versioning my, my code. And I'll have a lot of confidence in what I'm deploying to. So 
Um, I think that's really super, super advantageous. So Elijah and Lee, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. It's been, I think we all agree this has been really super helpful and really instructive. Um, and I, and I think it's, it's great it, as they both have mentioned that there, there are emails right there and, or I'm sorry, those are Twitter handles and I, I appreciate, um, you guys doing that. That's really, really, um, wonderful to, to help out the community. So, um, thanks everybody. Let's put the cloud engineering stream, uh, or the, the summit up one more time, Mark. Oh, there you go. Yeah. We'd love to have you join us on that too. Um, like we said, a workshop and, and lots of other great information. So please, um, please join us there. Yeah. Thanks. That's awesome. All right. We'll, we'll end it here. Thanks everybody. Since there are no more questions, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.